Where does tradition start getting in the way of sharing the essence of something as times change? A lot of the time we misunderstand. We perceive someone as that might be trying to help us, someone maybe trying to harm us. How do we learn how to care? We have to know what's in the best interest of that individual and what their next step is. It's not just throughout the ages that Krishna reappears, but it's within our own hearts throughout our lifetime Krishna reappears and reappears to re-establish truth. Let's not forget that the result of all of these efforts are not down to us. Whoa. Before we jump into this episode, I'd love to invite you to join this candid spiritual community to hear more conversations that will help you become happier, healthier and more healed. All I want you to do is click on that subscribe button because I love your support. I love seeing all the comments pouring through, all the love pouring through and we're just getting started. I can't wait to go on this journey with you whether you're a spiritual seeker or you're just curious about the topic. And we really hope that our conversations will provide you food for thought and inspiration for your own spiritual journey. So join us for honest, candid discussions about spirituality for soul's sake. For soul's sake, for soul's sake. Welcome to another episode of For Soul's Sake, a candid, honest, spiritual conversation where I bring you two of my best mates, one of the best books in the world. We're going to talk about all things spirituality. And today the topic is juicy. Are you guys ready? Yes. Ready. I'm on the edge of my seat. Ready as ever. Wow. Okay, let's, let's get stuck in. in. <laughs> uh, this is from chapter four of the Bhagavad Gita, text number seven. Translation. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whenever there's a decline in religion and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time Krishna descends himself. Well, I mean, aren't we in a period of that right now? Yeah. Yes. Where you at, God? Krishna. Krishna. Right. I mean, we understand that Krishna descends in different forms. Mm -hmm. And the form for this age is the divine name Mm. of of God. Mm. So Harinam is the form in which right now we have access to mm. the avatar the avatar the of the avatar i mean one thing that piques my interest immediately is the different ways in which divinity descends based on time place and circumstance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this topic of time place and circumstance and the presentation of spirituality based on that could be quite an interesting angle to take this first yeah yeah i often feel like Time, place, and circumstance, but also when different religions in the past have come up mm-hmm. to certain populaces, and specifically how the instruction, even though the essence was the same, but it was slightly shifted in its presentation for that populace. Give mm. an example. So, like for example, in in Christianity, you know, the the Bible is very much around morals. It's very much about right or wrong behavior, what to do, what not to do. Here's a story to exemplify that. Um, Buddhism is very much around the, the philosophical aspects of Buddhism around monism. Uh, you know, that's definitely propagated Detachment, a lot. Detachment, ahimsa. Yeah, ahimsa, non-violence. And then obviously with the Bhagavad Gita, you're entering very detailed levels of philosophy, very detailed levels of consciousness about the self, about God, the nature of God. Those things aren't touched as as detailed within other particular areas. And perhaps because the Bhagavad Gita is a lot older than a lot of modern religions that mm. we see as well. Does that mean that the Indian populace are more advanced? I was learning that there's um, ancient, there's ancient. three types of scripture from India, mm-hmm. from ancient India. So you have the Veda, which mm-hmm. is um, very in-depth, precise, uh, empirical, uh, epistemological knowledge. Yeah. Then you have the Puranas, which are not the fish, not the fish, the <laughs> Puranas, the Itihasas, they're like uh, histories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you have, um, they're called Kavyas, which are poetic renditions of story, which contain a central truth. Mm-hmm. So for instance, the Ramayan, the Mahabharat, um, the Upanishads, yeah. these can be considered Kavyas, yeah. They're like, they are um, easy to access, f- 
for, I guess, people who aren't academic or philosophically inclined. They're easy to access and and yeah. gain truth and, and like parallels and parables. Would you say? Yeah. Or you have this. Um, we we're really interested these days in uh, what are they called? A little mantras people call proverbs. Them. Proverbs. That's yeah. the word. You know these yeah. kind of proverbs. They're like, um, yeah, they're they're kind of small nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but all of these three presentations of truth exist at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm. And also, what's interesting is that they're ever relevant because if truth is true then it's always true Eternally, it's never yeah. not true yeah. so i find that really interesting because people think that knowledge or philosophy or truth is perhaps reserved for a higher echelon of person mm. but actually it should be accessible to everyone at all times yeah. but the presentation might be very academic or it could be like story based and very yeah. poetic yeah um but the essence remains the same throughout mm. all of history fun fact the first recording mm. ever known to man was a recording of the rig veda mm. yeah did you know that yeah far out first ever thing recorded like like audio recorded wow. thomas edison thomas edison mm. yeah amazing yeah but time, place, circumstance. Okay, so we've covered that it's for everyone. It's not that Indians are supreme. Yeah. It's for everyone. Time, place, circumstance. We enter into the realm of present presenting spirituality according to the time, which means there is some creative license of, mm-hmm. would you say, changing the way it's presented. For example, we present kirtan or I present kirtan in Western clothing, mm-hmm. Western dress. I don't wear any markings on my mm-hmm. forehead. I do wear these, my kanti mala, mm-hmm. but I choose what things I externally present myself as mm-hmm. in order to try and break that barrier and get that out of the way so that people can get into it. But that's just my approach. Mm. That's not that it's a one mm. size fits all. Yeah. But I guess the question I want to ask you both is, where's the line? Mm. For me, I'm I'm very about what what do you what is the essence and what is your purpose? with this practice what is the essence of the practice so if it's kirtan yeah the purpose of kirtan is to share the experience of chanting mantras and the divine connection to be experienced you can no one can argue with that right for me what is the purpose behind someone sharing kirtan to make that as accessible to as many individuals in the world because we know it to be a universal true practice and anyone and everyone can access kirtan and feel the experiences Mm -hmm. that are revealed in the scriptures right when that essence and purpose are strong enough, how we do that actually doesn't matter as much. And the same can be said for like the practice of Christianity mm-hmm. with the introduction of the Alpha Course, a very modern form of... What is that? The Alpha Course is like um, within Christian communities. It's like a sort of a course on their basic a, philosophy. A bridge version. Yeah. But it's a very modern, very cutting edge, very successful actually mm. in terms of the amount of people who sign up to learn about Christianity through mm. that. Mm. It isn't, you know, super like Catholic, Catholic like mm. it's not in terms of how it's presented, very sort of, you know, very traditional in that sense. And you've got, you know, priests wearing their traditional clothes, nothing like that, very okay. modern. So I'm, I always struggle with the whole, um, where does tradition start getting the way of sharing the essence of something as times change. Say that again. Where does where does tradition? Yeah. And tradition, not spirituality. Tradition is tradition, right? Where does tradition get in the way as time goes on in sharing the essence wow. or the essential teaching mm. of something? Wow, wow, wow. Because you know, like sometimes I find people can become very attached to the tradition and the way something is done rather than being attached to sharing the essence of what is being done. Mm-hmm. They're two different things. Mm-hmm. Right? Thoughts, Kelly? One ex- kind of thought, I've not heard this before, I don't know if I'm making it up or not, but it seems relevant. I'm just thinking about a hypothetical situation where, say you're a charitable organisation, mm. and someone calls up and say, hey, I want to donate £100,000 to your charity. 
out of love. I really, yeah. I am invested in what you're doing. Out of complete love, I want to, you know, do they donate this money? Yeah. So they come to your headquarters and they donate the money, right? But they show up and maybe they're a bit, um, I don't know, they're not very well dressed, right? Or maybe they they speak in a funny way or maybe they um, accidentally knock over a plant pot and some water and soil goes somewhere, right? You're not going to reprimand that person because you're really touched by the charitable donation and you know that they're doing it out of love so they might not be presenting themselves in a perfect way but the love factor is there mm. the reason i tell this story is because the first time i went to a temple i was with a friend who we sat on the floor we we were completely ignorant and we'd gone purely out of curiosity and love for what we were looking to find there my friend was sat with his legs out straight in front of him facing the altar space and someone came up to my friend and um started telling him off oh and saying you shouldn't put your feet facing the direction of the altar because that's a sacred like place. telling off me that was super heavy about it not super heavy but they it were like could, yeah it was yeah, a bit yeah. it made a bit of a quirky atmosphere it was like oh, okay. can you please put your your legs away it shouldn't be facing the altar because that's a sacred space right and it's almost offensive yeah so he was like, yeah, of course, like I just didn't, I didn't know, but it created a, a strange atmosphere. Mm. And I was on reflection, I was just thinking, was that the best way to have dealt with that? Mm. Would it maybe have been better to tolerate it? And even though, you know, it might be wrong, would it have been better to tolerate that, you know, situation and help the person come to a stage of yeah. knowledge and then in the future they can learn, you know, this isn't the right yeah. way to do it. This is the right way to do it. And I think we're very yeah. quick to pick people up on things um, without understanding that actually they, they're just lacking knowledge. Yeah. It's not done out of any malice. It's not done out of yeah. any uh, yeah negativity, yeah. you know. This is, I guess the modern take on sharing spirituality has to be centered around understanding people mm. and understanding, in some sense, having an intuition about their motivation. Right. Like intuitively feeling that this person will respond better to kind words mm. than harsh, mm -hmm. corrective language. Yeah. And I guess one thing that I've been very inspired to do is to try and formulate language, mm. presentation mm. in such a way that's done that. And I guess it's different for each person. Like, I'm not going to advocate that everybody do it like me. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the things that when I, when I go traveling, people want to know the most is what's the formula because mm. they see the videos or they see the uh, end product being quote unquote successful. Mm. Um, but they want to know what the formula is. And my general answer is there isn't one. Mm. You have to figure out what's authentic to you yeah. and mm. uh, what's your intuition about the people. Mm -hmm. Like if you can understand the people, then you can understand what they need mm -hmm. as opposed to what you want to give them all the time. Yeah. yeah. That's like the number one way in which I can tell um, in my own self, but also when I meet someone, whether they're going to be able to change hearts mm. is do they care about the people? Mm. Do they genuinely care about the people that they're presenting to mm. or they, do they just want to get to the end result? Yeah. Yeah, and it's this, this point Kaylee just mentioned as well. In your story, Kaylee, it was this kind of just links in really nicely to what you said, is the essence was lost there. Right. Yeah. The essence of the fact that there is a curious person coming to this temple space because they're kind of interested, want to know a bit more. Mm -hmm. The essence was lost and the tradition was dialed down on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The traditional etiquette in mm -hmm. that particular case, right? And therefore, mm -hmm. if you care, if you care enough, you will always be seeing the essence of the person. You'll mm -hmm. always be seeing where this person's coming from because you care about them. It's a personal focus right mm -hmm. how do we learn how to care we have to know what's in the best interest of that individual and what their next step is but how do we know without walking a mile in their shoes we ask we ask yeah we ask um understand their pain points i'll tell you something really fascinating actually that i, I learned recently is um at work we were designing this leadership program for leaders in asia so japan india china and they all came and there was one individual who had a bit of a disability 
And I designed all these really cool activities, mm. right? That we're going to do stand up, icebreakers, really cool yeah. stuff. He had a disability, so he couldn't really get up and walk anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, myself and my team we were figuring out what should we do for him? Should we do it like this? Should we do it like this? Should we change this activity? Maybe we shouldn't do the activity. And one of the individuals said, No, just ask him. Yeah. Mm. Just ask him. What yeah. does he want? Mm. What would he prefer? Yeah. So simple, right? Yeah, and that's that goes back to the one size fits all thing that you know yeah. when we're sharing spirituality, it's not that the same thing that we were given is going to be appreciated by the the person that we're giving it to. Mm -hmm. That they're not going to go through the same journey that we are, and I think that's one thing that when people receive the chanting, then they immediately want to share that with their friends and family. And one of the questions that I'm sure we all have gotten is. Why are they not take? Why is my brother and sister and mother and father like? Mm. Why are they not appreciating kirtan? Like mm. I love it so much and it's incredible, but why don't they get it? Like is this them? That's the problem, right? They don't get it, mm -hmm. and it's rather seeing it not as they don't get it, but they need something else. Mm. And this, that's why this process for for me anyway has been so incredible because it's so multi layered and so many mm. different ways in which you can engage and be personal with your relationship with divinity. And I think that's that's why I think that. Even God, in this verse here, descends in different forms according to the people. That should be a lesson enough for us. Like, yeah. if he, God Himself is appearing on Earth in different forms in different uh, parts of the world, different parts of India, different, different texts, different, different texts, different stories, different you know ways in which they interact with their devotees. It's all like mm. variety. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so personal. Yeah, super personal. It's and it's extremely caring. Yeah, like it would make sense for God to do that. Yeah, if if we subscribe to the belief that God is mm. all caring. Mm. Um, the funny thing is this: this story comes to mind of uh, this person who had a bird trapped in their house, flew in th through the window. That sounds like fun. And they were trying to help this bird get out. They were like, really, genuinely, I want the best for you. You're not meant to be in this house. <laughs> yeah. And so they open every window, right? And what does the bird do? Fly into the next room. Right. Uh, open every window in that room. What does the bird do? Fly into the next room. Right. It's trying so hard, like starts to get a broom and like gently try and shift it, you know, to a window. It's just struggling, struggling, struggling. It's like, I've opened every door. I've opened every window for you. And you think that I'm trying to attack you, right? right. You're free. It's, you know, it's an open prison. You can yeah. just leave, <laughs> right? But you, we misunderstand. And uh, I think that that's uh, an interesting analogy for a predicament we might find ourselves in a lot of the time we misunderstand the opportunity yeah. we have and we we perceive someone as that might be trying to help us someone maybe trying to harm us mm. um, I love that analogy I've heard a similar analogy about houses and different rooms about how once um, a, a bhakti yoga teacher was asked does it matter that there are different rooms in the same house? Mm. And the response was, no, it doesn't matter as so long as everyone can find a place in at least one of the rooms. Mm. So practice however you want. Like practice in monk attire. Mm. Practice in non-monk attire. Practice in focused in, in, in this one discipline, chanting, or mm. with reading the scripture, or with learning how to make sanctified food really professionally, or dressing the deities on the altar, mm. You know, performing the the rituals that are performed, the ceremonies that are performed on the altar, do it according to your taste, mm. and learn how to not criticize anyone else's. Mm. You know, because the thing is that we could easily point fingers on the surface of anyone, but yeah. um, I can't remember the author who says this. If I have to remember, I think it's Mother David Key. She writes a book about this on on. Uh, uh, creating wholesome communities. I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but she writes how if we're criticizing someone's approach to presenting mm. according to time, place, and circumstance, mm -hmm. it's basically like us saying, "Don't be so good at that. Right? Like, don't yeah. serve the deities so nicely. Right. Yeah. Don't cook so nicely. Like, why are you cooking so nicely? Yeah. You know, it's just it's pointing the finger where actually what they're trying to do is trying to serve. Yeah. yeah. And it we might find ourselves in a situation where we. Uh, we end up in the spiritual world and we look around and we're like, 
how did you get here? How did you get here? Hold on, how did you get here? And they're all looking at us like, how did you get here? <laughs> Yeah. It's this it's this need for the you need both parties, right? So you need people who are progressive with their spiritual practice and Agreed. moving it forward. Agreed. But you also need the traditionists who rein back when perhaps Definitely. the progressive people are getting a bit Definitely. too funky and it's like, whoa. <laughs> a bit too funky. You know, rein it back here. That's you're going a bit <laughs> overboard. Because that does happen. Oh yeah. Right. So you almost need that as mutual respect at least. Yeah. 100%. You know, there's a need for traditionalism to keep things grounded and according to the true purports of what mm. you're practicing. But you need progression to help. I, I, I fear for future generations. Honestly. Me too. Like Radigate, your kids are gonna, you know, grow Old up world. and as they grow up into that new generation. I just I just fear for where they will be and how they will perceive things and how much repositioning will have to be done because and maybe it won't be. And maybe we'll just go back into a full circle where actually people just want it super traditional. Who knows? Yeah. Mm. But change is always needed and um I've got a theory on that. Hmm. Yeah. I think that those who are young and have energy, I consider myself part of that. Up until the age of 50, I'd say you're considered like somewhat relevant in the world. Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity for which you should go out and try and share with the people of the world because you get the psyche, you get the people. Mm -hmm. Once you cross the kind of age barrier, mm. there's a certain, I don't know what that time is, is different for each person, but once you cross it and you recognize by self-awareness that you don't understand the people anymore. Like mm. we were saying, we don't care. It's not that we don't care, we just don't understand them anymore. Mm. Then I think there's space for uh, pastoral care mm. and inner institutional work. Mm. Like, I don't understand, per se, the need for all persons of all generations to constantly outreach to new generations. Mm -hmm. mm. I think it, it's still outreach to new people when you're sharing spirituality, when you look after the people inside the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like at a certain point, when you hit 50, 60, wherever it is, you start going maybe a bit more internal. And that's my internal plan. Like I'm, I'm thinking about it a little bit. It's not like my master plan. But once I cross a threshold where I'm like, you know what? I think the next generation can take this on. Mm -hmm. And they can do it in their fun way and dynamic mm -hmm. way and whatever way mm -hmm. they want to do it. Let me try and go a little bit more in-house mm. and focus on the people there. Yeah. And that might be the solution, in my opinion. I like this term, uh, being a custodian of faith. Mm. And I think that if you're going to outreach, then um, where are you going to take people to? You need to right. like bring them somewhere, right? Mm. So sometimes I feel like spiritual institutions are a bit like um, Ikea. <laughs> that's a weird one all right let's go with it it's really easy to go in but really difficult to leave <laughs> yeah mm. <laughs> and we put so much of our focus on let's make new devotees let's convert people let's you know convince people let's in, in you know inspire people right and then we have people and then it's like so what do we do what now yeah. right um yeah it's you need a roadmap. Yeah, yeah, I think you you need the the young generation is there, but uh, we should also realize the wisdom and the substance that comes from having elders in a yeah. community. But I think that, like you said, I think that's really um, valuable point. The jobs they don't have to be the same. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, it shouldn't be the same. Yeah, I yeah. think that uh, also evolution. It's it's not necessarily linear, you know. Right. It it could be Cyclical, all over the totally. place. Yeah. yeah. Totally. So And let let me disclaim it. It's not that I'm saying that anyone who's of a certain age should give up on Sure. That's not it's it's based on time, place, circumstance, based on the person's ability, based on their relevancy, etc. 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 But I think that there needs to be once you're of a senior position in your position is a wrong word. Once you're in a senior, ad somewhat advanced state of mm. consciousness, then consider that it's your responsibility to also now make sure that the next generation are mm. well maintained and, you know, they have the standards and they understand um, what the principles are. Mm. There's a level of detachment as well. It's like yeah. I, I'm mm. not not through personal experience. I don't know this, but I've heard <coughs> being a parent is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Yeah. It's not having the child. It's not raising the child. It's letting them go. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not advocating on them the way you want to live, mm-hmm. want them to live. And mm-hmm. You have to let them be. Just to let them be, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting because a lot of, uh, sometimes when we don't understand generations mm-hmm. and how they want to do things, it's often because we're too attached to how we want to do things. Right. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's not a disagreement. It's I'm. I'm attached to how I like to do things. Yeah. Back Theref- in my day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I don't understand yeah. you. The humble person would be like, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Maybe don't totally get where you're coming from, but I get that you want to do things differently. Yeah. And I get that as a generation, you like to receive things in this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The elders that I respect the most, for example, are those that don't immediately come in with advice. Mm. <laughs> And I have to catch myself because I often do it myself to younger generations. Right. I'm like, back in, oh, man, isn't that 10, 15 years ago? <laughs> back in uh, one hour ago. <laughs> one hour ago. This is how we did it. But the point is that not to impress upon them about how we did things as well. Yeah. And I guess it's, it's, it's a part of the journey and lifespan of any spiritual institution is that you have to start somewhere and each mm. generation will have an iteration where they, they, they change things and trying to learn from the previous generations. What we've got is very unique, though, mm. I feel, because we've got people in our bhakti movement, the Hare Krishna movement, mm-hmm. that were there at the beginning. Mm. So we've got legacy. Mm-hmm. And we've got the resources, mm. especially in the UK, like we've mm-hmm. got some incredible resources here to be able to push the boundaries of what's possible. Mm. So here is a special place and here is a special dynamic place where interesting things can happen. Mm. But as legacy slowly fades, mm. that's going to be the interesting place which where you were talking about fear for my children. That's where I'm starting to worry. I'm like, well, where does the, the link and the conduit yeah. between legacy and, and uh, dynamism remain? Mm. Another thing that springs to mind here is um, let's not forget that the result of all of these efforts are not down to us. Mm. Whoa. Because there is also this element, this underlying element, as much as we take on the responsibility and we should to try and share as an act of compassion, the results of how this is going to pave out into future generations for all spiritual paths isn't actually down to just us. Mm. Like, we're not going to sh- change the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can damn right try, but yeah. we can only try for these 60, 70, 80 years that we have really in this it's life. It's a right? blip, isn't it? It's a blip in the ocean of, like, this whole movie, which is full of so many scenes and chapters. Yeah. Mm. We just get the, the credit for the little that we do, you know? I heard this one thing where it's... um. It's talking about Sri Chaitanya and people were saying, well, if Sri, Sri Chaitanya 500 years ago was so powerful that everyone he met would, you know, transform into this loving being mm. filled mm. with divine love, mm. then why didn't he just do that across the world and end the job? Mm-hmm. And the response was so that you get the credit. Mm. You know? And learning how to deal with that credit is a whole new trip. Mm. But I think that that's beautiful that God... Krishna has given us the opportunity to do some work here so that we can be part of this glorious mm. revolution, this eclipsing age, this Aquarian age, whatever mm. you want to call it. We get to be part of a small little flip of that. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I'm finding interesting as well is how many versions of myself there seem to be in this one life. Mm. and Year on year almost. Yeah. And so... It's great to think about how God descends in different times and in different ways throughout millennia, but how also God can appear within our hearts throughout our lives Mm. in the different phases of our life. Mm. And that's something I'm coming to appreciate more now. Like, I've only been practicing bhakti for uh, eight years, but the amount of change that has happened personally in my life in eight years has been ridiculous Mm. but the constant appearance is always the same krishna's there i'm still here i'm Mm. still here i'm still here and i really i take a lot of solace in knowing that um it's not just throughout the ages that krishna reappears but it's within our own hearts throughout our lifetime krishna reappears and reappears to re-establish truth yes 
Yeah, and before, I guess a precursor to all of this talk about time, place, circumstance, and sharing in new age ways, the precursor to all of that is you have to manifest divinity in your own heart first. Mm. Mm. You know, and how do we do that? You know, Narada Muni actually in the Narada Bhakti Sutras, he mentions that three ways that you can um, mm-hmm. you can manifest Krishna in your heart. Mm. And he says the first is you have to give up the association of materialistic persons. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Mm. Give up the association of material p- persons. Then he says, uh, try in every moment to hear and chant. Mm-hmm. And then he says a third one, which I've forgotten now. <laughs> I mean, those two are. I mean, it's big enough. Something yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah. But do you know how how cool it is that because Krishna doesn't just appear when when it's like okay, yeah, you're you're like doing good now. You're a devotee. Yeah, right, cool, right, I'm going right. to show up. It can happen at any time. Yeah. He was there when I was like a stinky hippie. He was there when I was trying my best to be like a proper monk. Yeah. He's all he he's Always not thinking there. like no you're not worthy, no you're not yeah. ready, no you're not this, you're not that. He's just always appearing for us and giving us opportunities. What I find is so so amazing is that no matter how divinity wants to turn up in your life, supreme Krishna always loves you. Mm. Yeah. I've often questioned myself, am I loved by Krishna? Am I loved? Maybe he doesn't. Mm. I don't think he does. My life is my life is too diabolical. I don't think so. <laughs> diabolical. Like, you know, too, like, I don't I don't think it, <laughs> I don't think he loves me. And then I, I, I read stuff and I get messages from different people and it's like, oh my god, you're a fool. Mm. You're a fool to think that Krishna's love is limited by someone like you. You think you're so bad. Mm. You know? And uh, that's very comforting. Mm. It's very warming to 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 understand the nature of God's unlimited love. Yeah, the love supreme. That yeah. name is given for a reason, right? There was once a disciple and a guru, and the disciple comes up to the guru and says, "By chanting all of these mantras and reading all of these scriptures, will I be able to manifest the appearance of Krishna or God in my life?" Mm. And the guru smiles at the disciple and says, "No." <laughs> So the disciples like, well, and what's the point in all this? So he asks, he's like, but but Guruji, like, why are you making me do all this then? Yeah. And the guru responds, he says, so that you're awake when the sun rises. We can put in all of this endeavor, mm. and it won't do diddly squat to make us be awake to see that the sun is always mm. rising. Mm. Mm. But the practice itself is to try and get us into this. How do we call it? Yellow bus syndrome. Have you heard about that? When you just see yellow buses. You see yeah. yellow buses. If someone tells you, spot the yellow buses all of today, I mean, in the UK, we don't get many yellow buses, but at least yellow lorries or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so you start spotting them everywhere. Can I Can I show my geeky side God. here? Go on. Are you still going to love me? I'll always love we'll you. Try. Okay. So we were talking about this actually before the episode. On social media, there is an algorithm where if you look at something, it will suggest more of that thing to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We have that in our own minds. Mm. It's called the reticular activating system. Oh, yeah. R-E-S. R-A-S. A-S, RAS. Reticular activating system. We actually have this. Everyone has it. Before mm. social media, mm. this has existed in human beings. The original beings. algorithm. Yeah, the original algorithm. Repeat one more time. Reactive. Reticular Retic- activating system. Reticular the activating rest. system. That's really interesting you say that because whenever I go and buy a car and I've looked at that car loads on Auto Trader, you start seeing it everywhere. I'll see it everywhere and on the way to the place. I'm but, in that place right now. Yeah. So I know exactly but do what you know, it feels like. Do you know that this reticular activating system can destroy us or uplift us? How mm. interesting. Because it works on our beliefs. So, for instance, if we walk around and we believe that we are. Um, unworthy of love, right? Then our reticular activating system will show us things mm. in our external world to enforce, reinforce that belief that we're not worthy of love. Wow! But if we walk around and think, "I'm very grateful. I'm worthy. I'm. I have so much uh, to be grateful for in my life." Then our reticular activating system will pick out all of those things because yeah. at any given time, there's so much information to take in through our senses, mm. right? So. That's actually one nice way of trying to see uh, divinity everywhere, yeah. right? 
because the more we have faith and the more that we have belief that divinity is present the more that will be shown to us and the more that we'll see it because mm. uh, it just works by enforcing our reinforcing our beliefs and uh, yeah. i don't think the complexity of the human body and the human brain and the human mind and the human heart is just random mm. Mm. you know <laughs> that like this is such an incredible vehicle that we've been given yeah. so the fact that we have one of these reticular activating <laughs> systems yeah, means that true. maybe that's actually there to help us see oh here's a yellow bus here's a yellow bus mm. there's krishna there's krishna there's krishna mm. Mm. sounds like manifestation like that. but scientifically presented yeah thanks for that so yeah. right reticular activating activating System. system. I yeah. feel so smart right now. If you've yeah. got a Nobel Prize out there, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm ready for it. In a recent, in a, in a soon to be dinner talk, <laughs> you know, uh, just heard about this. It's, uh, the reticular, the, the reticular activating, the reticular activating system. system. Have you heard about it? No. <laughs> Where have you been, dear fellow? Where have you been? Living under a rock, have you? Oh Lord. <laughs> now I have to explain it to you. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all so much for joining us for this episode of For Soul's Sake. I hope it was useful. As always, I'm praying that we continue to be of some service in this way. I hope it's been um, educational, but I hope there's also moments for you to consider some transformation too. That it's not just information, 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 but maybe there's something that you want to jot down on a piece of paper for you to try and change, for you to try and move towards, for you to try and... Uh, yeah, manifest in your life today. So wishing you all the best, lots of spiritual strength. And thank you once again for joining us. See you on the next one. If you love this podcast, you'll love my interview with Ambika Devi on how art and spirituality can be used to make a difference in this world. The only way you can really be happy is when you serve others and when you have a purpose to connect with God. That's the only way you will be happy. Otherwise, no money, no fame, no beauty nothing can really fulfill you you know and then we are uh, living beings that the only thing that can fulfill us is love and service <laughs>